Author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Serious commentators and even some politicians are beginning to say that the nation is spiraling out of control under the current administration. While Americans are looking to the southern border as waves of immigration push the public purse to breaking point, inflation moves further out of control. The Omicron variant prompts more restrictions across the world. One wonders what President Biden's, and indeed the rest of the government on both sides of the divide, priorities actually are. Well, it seems that selling cars for Elon Musk, setting up UFO task forces, and fundraising of Supreme Court cases are the order of the day. And all those other concerns? Well, according to the government, you're just looking at things the wrong way. Winston Churchill once said, you'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. What is Joe Biden's ultimate destination for the United States? And how many defenseless dogs will be hurt along the way? Welcome to Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio America Network. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's special show, we're going to be discussing why the Pentagon is setting up a new department to check out unidentified aerial phenomena, or UFOs as we used to call them, how Transport Secretary Pete Buttigieg found himself in the role of salesman for the electric vehicle industry, and why he's likely to fail. Tim Donnell will be joining us for the flagship Say What show, finding the most wacky and damnable sound bites from the bizarre world of politics and the media. Let's not forget, Abortion is up before the Supreme Court. We'll be hearing the bell toll for 50 years of Roe v. Wade. All this and a whole lot more on Liberty Nation Radio. I'd like to say a special thank you to our listeners in Arlington, Virginia on WWRC, 570 AM. Thank you for tuning in and being part of the team. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American Constitution. Unidentified aerial phenomena, or UFOs as they were once known, are causing a stir yet again in Washington, D.C. Or as Liberty Nation author and former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Controller Dave Patterson wrote in a recent article, unidentified aerial phenomena have landed at the Pentagon. Now, why this sudden renewed interest in the field of UFOs? And what does it imply about what was once considered the realm of tin foil hat wearers. Welcome back to the show, Dave. Thank you, Mark. And as you notice, I don't have my tin foil hat on. We, we did discuss this. It's uh, just come back from the, the cleaners. Uh, so it's not quite dry yet. So Dave, unidentified aerial phenomena, UFOs, why are they making news in the swamp yet again? Well, because at the end of November, the Defense Department, uh, it was directed by Congress, established this new office within the uh, Department of Defense, and it's called, are you ready? Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or in polite circles, we call that the AOI MSG, not to be confused with the meat tenderizer. Absolutely. Uh, Also illegal in some countries, that particular (laughs) tenderizer. That's correct. You know, it, it... it has a, an interesting mission uh, and that it's designed to or set in, uh, in, in, into being to identify, detect, attribute, attribute objects of interest, you know, in, in, but only in special use airspace. Okay. And special then, use airspace being? Well, uh, military operational areas, uh, the airspace over Washington, D.C., the airspace over London anything that is uh, regulated by the uh, air traffic control and, and designated as special use airspace. So it's only in that, in that rather limited uh, uh, space that, that they're interested. Uh, and, and they're also supposed to mitigate any uh, appropriate or associated threats. It's not clear to me how they do that, but you know, they're, they're bureaucrats. So is, is, it, is it possible that mitigating yeah. threats here could also mean dissemination of information or as we like to call it, propaganda? Well, they don't tell you what that means exactly. Uh, it could be that or possibly uh, attempting to uh, 
capture one of these things or shoot it down or do something to, uh, as they say, uh, to mitigate any associated threats. Um, and and it, it, you know, it, it replaces the uh, unidentified uh, aerial phenomenon task force, a much less unwieldy name, I might add, what was, that was set up back in August of 2020. Okay, it seems to me there's two lines of thinking here, Dave. The first is that uh, these are what the traditionalists in the field think. They're crafts from outer space. Uh, and the other, perhaps more mainstream, acceptable view is that they're foreign tech that the U.S. just can't fathom. Now, where does the Pentagon fall on this issue? And, and if it is foreign tech, does that suggest that other nations are, and we're presuming China here, I guess, uh, other nations have such technological advantage that all U.S. warfare models have just become useless. Well, it appears that the Pentagon would like to dismiss the former as unlikely and is very fearful of the latter. But having said that, you know, overcoming you know, what has been traditionally stumbling blocks for the, in the laws of physics, you know, that moves in fits and starts. And it's highly unlikely that uh, either Russia or China could suddenly have this immense leap to allow objects moving at the speeds that are attributed to the reported sightings. Uh, it's also not, it's not just the speeds either, is it? it's the ability no, it's to maneuver and, and turn. Maneuvering at very high Gs. Okay, so what's the political view of UAPs at the moment? <laughs> Oddly enough, it's it, it, even in today's highly charged partisan atmosphere, this appears to be a bipartisan issue. I mean, you have folks like uh, Senator uh, Marco Rubio, a Republican, as well as uh, Harry Reid, former uh, leader of the Senate, uh, a Democrat. So you have, it, it really is a, a bipartisan issue. And, and what I believe their point is, and I think this is an admirable point, and that is if these things are flying around, do they represent a hazard to uh, airlines, military operations, and uh, I think that uh, their point is we need to answer that question. Okay, so many presidents and presidential contenders have promised to offer what's known in the, in the field as full disclosure on UFO or, or uh, UAP information that's held by the government when, uh, if they're elected. But it never seems to happen. Well, I think that the explanation may be twofold. First, disclosure of information which is not satisfying is, uh, you know, that there are hundreds of sightings and we can disclose, we can discuss those, the where, the when, et cetera. We don't know what they are, and, uh, but we're gonna continue to study them. Well, that's an answer that's not very satisfying, but that's the answer that they're kind of stuck with. The second part is a little more tricky. And for them to go into detail with some of the military sightings particularly could expose sensitive technical means by which the sightings were made. And they're not going to want to do that very readily. One of the things that's overlooked is that although freedom of information requests are legally enforceable, when the government enters into a, a partnership with a private company, uh, like a public-private initiative, these records become no longer available because they're a proprietary domain of the companies. Is it possible that the federal government is purposely working with the private sector? You know, the government is going to do what it has to do to get to the objective that it has. And, uh, but as far as I know, that hasn't happened. And uh, quite frankly, I think that, believe it or not, the government has been pretty forthcoming with what they're doing. And they're quite willing to admit they have no idea what these things are. But they're very quick to establish a bureaucratic office that will detect, identify, and attribute, as well as mitigate any appropriate threats. Dave Patterson, thank you ever so much. Thank you, Mark. It's always good to be with you. Later in the show, we have Tim Donner hosting a special Say What segment, and Scott Casenza digging deep into the abortion case up before the Supreme Court, the facts you won't hear in the legacy media. But coming up next... We try to figure out why Pete Buttigieg is acting like a car salesman for the EV industry rather than transport secretary for the United States. Don't touch that dial. Hey.
We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. The once and future presidential hopeful Pete Buttigieg, now in battle transport secretary, is on a mission to sell electric vehicles to the American public. And yet bizarre statements regarding cost savings and the economic benefits seem to be confounding Americans rather than convincing them. Now, is Mayor Pete out of his depth on both facts and economics? Well, to figure that out, we're joined by author and economist, Andrew Moran. Welcome back to the show, Andrew. Thank you for having me. So tell me, what's Mayor Pete's sales pitch? And does it, as the nation's favorite lawyer and cousin, Vinny Gambini, once asked, hold water? Yeah, so he appeared on MSNBC the other day, and he told the audience essentially that if you buy an electric vehicle, that families would never have to worry about gasoline prices again. He said that uh, they would save, uh, they would have a twelve and a half thousand dollars in discount on transportation costs. Now, I think he came across a per- perpetual motion machine if he thinks that families will not never need to worry about uh, energy costs again. Yeah, so the first, the car alone is 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 more expensive uh, than your than your typical compact vehicle. Uh, the average uh, the, the average price of a new compact car is about twenty five thousand dollars, but the average cost of the of a new EV is more than fifty one thousand dollars. That's a huge discrepancy you're paying. The other issue is maintenance and repair. Uh, from the wide range of studies and reports I've seen, which I included in my recent article about it, it will cost you so much more if you repair your EV now. There is a debate on whether or not maintenance is more expensive on either side, but the one, one estimate I've seen is from AAA, and it said that owning an, EV, you know, owning an EV will hit you about $600 more per year than a, than a traditional gas-fueled car. So it could take a long time before anyone would see any of these discounts that he's talking about. Well, that's one of the questions I've come to. So he says the folks who buy an electric vehicle, they'll never need to worry about the price of gas ever again. But of course, electric vehicles... They, they don't run, as you point out, on perpetual motion machines. They, they run on energy, and energy costs money. And, of course, energy is, the energy market, is subject to fluctuations, especially when uh, government gets too heavily involved in them. Added to that, the initial cost price that you talked about of roughly $26,000 in advance, why can't Pete Buttigieg see the discrepancy that it will cost the owners? Well, I, I think it's probably seeped in the ideology. You know, this this part of the debate that how you say grinds my gears in this EV car debate. The left never tells the truth on the nuts and bolts of EVs. You know, first powering these cars requires electricity. Where does where does this electricity come from? Most of it is natural gas, coal, nuclear. Now, these are the three things that frightens progressives the most. They absolutely can't stand these. They only want wind and solar powering everything, which of course is unfeasible. Yeah, the other issue is how these car batteries are made. What is the primary component of these batteries? Lithium. How is it extracted? Using machinery and equipment constructed and made with fossil fuels. And if I, if I may add one more thing, if you look at the monthly inflation report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, electricity, electricity prices have skyrocketed 7% year over year. So even in that regard, it's hard to save money when you're canceling out gasoline for electricity just because of how expensive electricity is too in, these, in this type of market. All right, let's talk about the long-term costs of electric vehicles. So at the moment, as you point out, they're more expensive than a regular car. Um, But that will likely change as more people buy them, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. What about the second-hand or used car market implications? Uh, Am I right in thinking that electric vehicles essentially have a use-by date or the batteries on electric vehicles have a use-by date? So how will this impact the millions of Americans who, who can't afford a brand new car? Yeah, so this is the main problem I've seen with the used EVs. Now, the two main thing, two main issues affecting this type of market would be first the battery performance and then the outdated technology. So manufacturers, they routinely modify their battery composition and, and the overall technology accounting for the, you know, the, the new developments and part of this, uh, tech, and this technology. And it's, it's doubtful also that these automakers or even these used car dealers would cover the battery degradation costs. I don't think they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna put this in, in, in their balance sheets. Uh, also, you know, it's true, yes, that the, you know, the gasoline powered cars, their technology could be outdated, but these effects are probably more pronounced with EVs, especially the Tesla vehicles, because they have, you know, the, the Tesla vehicles are incredible machines, they're incredible machines, mm. you know, they have a lot of the self-driving capabilities. So that, that, that that's, that's a huge uh, aspect of it. And then, so overall, I think there are, there are a lot of uncertainties when it comes to buying a used EV, a lot more than it does with the, the conventional, uh, 
more conventional cars. And also the EV, EV use market is quite limited. I mean, you're not going to find as much as worth a gas powered car. So your choices are limited. This means that you're going to be paying a lot more than you would anything else. So I, I think right somewhere that the resale sticker price for a full electric car is around forty to $50,000. So right then there, you're better off buying a new uh, compact gas powered car than you would be buying even a used EV car at this point. Okay, now I can't help wondering why Pete Buttigieg in particular is the public face of this. He's the guy who's overseeing a supply chain crisis while his boss is in the process of making America dependent on energy imports again. Now, is this just a combined recipe for disaster? Well, I, I think Buttigieg, he probably still thinks it's 2020. So he sp still, he still has that mindset of speaking in platitudes. You know, everything he says, whether, you know, when he ran as a president or as a transportation secretary, it's all based on fairy dust and unicorns. He never goes in anything, anything specific. He never provides policy prescriptions where he just, you know, shrugs his shoulders and say, Hey, you know, I, I just came back from parental leave. Give me a break. So he, overall, he was very specific about racist roads, of course. And <laughs> Yeah. So overall, I, I just think, yeah, you're right. It is a recipe for Dasser. His boss, you know, he's the, he's begging OPEC to uh, ramp up production and ship more oil. Meanwhile, Trent, uh, Buttigieg is overseeing a supply chain crisis. So yeah, it is a recipe for Dasser's disaster. It's not improving anytime soon. Electric vehicles are great, but they're not, they're not, they're, not, they're great. They're, they're great long-term solutions, but short-term, they're not going to solve anything. All right, final question for you, Andrew. Now, why is the government even getting involved in this? As you point out, Elon, Elon Musk, for example, he makes a great car. So why are market forces not being left to their own device here? Now, surely if you build a better mousetrap, folks will buy it anyway. What's with the sales campaign? Oh, well, that's, it's just progressive paternalism at its best. It, it's a nudge. You know, both sides do this. Both Republicans and Democrats, they engage in the nudge philosophy. You know, the, the, that was put together by um, uh, Cass Sunstein, you know, real leftist icon. Uh, so, you know, government does this. They want to push you in a certain direction. You know, they, they like the idea of home ownership. So they grant you all these tax credits and tax deduction for home ownership. They like small businesses. So they, so they throw some, uh, small business tax credits left, right, and center. So when it comes to EVs and the overall climate change debate, it's just a new grift for the Democrats. You know, spending trillions of dollars that you don't have, mind you, on climate change is, is, is it's, it's a much easier sale pitch than saying, okay, you know what, we're just going to spend a trillion dollars for the heck of it, which is pretty much, if you, look, if you study all these bills like James Fight does, uh, our Liberty Nation correspondent, uh, he does a great job just pointing out pretty much, yeah, that's what it does. You just spend it for the sake of spending it, you know, even if it's just printed or borrowed and, you know, taxed. Andrew Moran, thank you ever so much. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Liberty Nation Radio. Heard across the Radio America network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC in Washington, D.C. And remember, you can tune in for Liberty Nation from 2 to 3 p.m. Sunday on KBKW 103.5 FM, 1450 AM, the talk of Grace Harbor. Coming up soon, we discuss the reasons why Congress refuses to make laws on abortion and why the Supreme Court may be a game changer. But next up... Longtime host of Liberty Nation Radio, Tim Donner, will be delving into the shocking and insensible sayings of politics and the media in our special Say What segment. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Welcome back to Liberty Nation Radio. We're going to hand over to longtime host of this here Liberty Nation Radio and Liberty Nation's senior political analyst, Tim Donner, to find out just how out for lunch are the political and media classes. Over to you, Tim. Okay, thank you, Mark. And the hottest of all hot-button political, constitutional, cultural, and religious issues was aired out at the Supreme Court this week. Abortion, Roe versus Wade. Now openly seen as endangered by a Supreme Court stocked with conservatives after three appointments by Donald Trump gave constitutionalists a six-to-three advantage. And the opportunity for which conservatives and pro-lifers have been waiting a lifetime. It's been almost 60 years since the famous or infamous decision by the nation's high court that unleashed the most bitterly explosive polarized debate we've ever witnessed about a ruling frequently challenged over six decades, but never overturned. Until perhaps now, in an abortion case from Mississippi, whose Solicitor General Scott Stewart argued that Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided and should be reversed by the nation's high court. 
and progressive justice, Elena Kagan provided the bookend response. Nowhere else does this court recognize a right to end a human life. Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey haunt our country. They have no basis in the Constitution. For 50 years, they've kept this court at the center of a political battle that it can never resolve. The, the rationale behind those cases uh, has something to do with the autonomy and the freedom and the dignity of women to pursue their lives as they wish to protect their bodily integrity. Well, those are perfect representations of the unmovable, unshakable positions of both the pro-life and pro-choice movements. And many court watchers are weighing in with the view that the court seems prepared to uphold the Mississippi law in question that bans abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy in what could be the most important abortion case in decades. We won't know their decision until they reconvene in June. Meanwhile, Americans long since weary of COVID-19 and the lockdowns associated with it are now being told of another variant of the deadly virus. This time it's called Omicron, another letter in the Greek alphabet found first in South Africa, with cases now reported in more than a dozen countries, including Canada and now in the US. This has led to travel bans and lockdowns overseas, and the uncertain response of the Biden administration has people starting to panic here. But the doctor who actually discovered the Omicron variant, Dr. Angeli Ketsi of South Africa, says there's no reason to panic. We don't see severely ill patients. So it started with the younger generation, 40 and less. And um, the most predominant clinical complaint is severe fatigue for one or two days with then the headache and the body aches and pain. And some will have a dry cough, but it's not a, con con a constant cough. It comes and goes. And that's more or less the, the big symptoms that we have seen. And yet you can count on control freak leftist politicians to start calling for fresh lockdowns and mandates and who knows what else. While the good news, at least at this point, is that this new COVID variant does not appear to be as lethal as we first feared, the bad news is that inflation continues to rise, taxing everyone all the time and everywhere. With Democrats responding to inflation with plans for a massive social welfare bill entitled Build Back Better, costing trillions GOP Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming calls it a fantasy. I view this as a back-breaking bill for the country uh, with the kind of expenses, the spending, the adding to the debt, the inflation, the taxes that are going to hit the American people. And, you know, for Joe Biden to say we have to spend even more money on top of inflation, I mean, to me, this is Alice in Wonderland logic. Well, pumping trillions more in federal money into an inflationary economy may seem like Alice in Wonderland, but it's nothing compared to the fantasy of a society with no federal prisons, where literally every prisoner accused of a federal crime would be released into the wind. No way, you say. Way, I respectfully respond. It's called the Breathe Act. And an incredulous Jonathan Swan of Axios News asked its chief advocate, Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, the obvious question. To what extent have you wrestled with any potential downsides of releasing into society every single person who's currently in a federal prison? Yeah, I, again, I think that everyone's like, oh my God, we're going to just release everybody. That's not That's what, what the Yeah, is. but did you see how many people are mentally ill that are in prison right now? No, I know, but the act that you so endorsed we're gonna keep, we're actually gonna, says release everyone But in, in 10, 10 years. years, but think about it, who will release But there are like human traffickers, oh, I know. child sex. So, but I you're mean, saying, do you mean that you don't actually support that? No. Because you endorse the bill. No, I endorse the BREATHE Act and looking at federal, uh, the policies and how we incarcerate, absolutely. But it says in there. But you cannot, you cannot... You cannot just blankly say, oh, look, she wants, that's not what I'm saying. But that's like in plain text. Your proposal is so sweeping. It, oh, does, oh, it does release yeah. everyone. And what I'm trying to say to you Within is- Within 10 years, and yeah. obviously there's a process of looking at how can we get away from mass incarceration. Sure. So let's see if we've got this straight. Because there are 
mentally ill people unjustly held in prison, we should release all the prisoners. That's perhaps the most toxic of all the one-step solutions from the one-step left. Things like guns kill people, so let's ban all guns. Some cops are corrupt, so let's ban all cops. And now the pièce de résistance. Some people in prison shouldn't be there, so let's ban all federal prisons. There, my friends, is an effective summary of the mind of the progressive. And we leave you with the comforting words of old Uncle Joe from the White House trying not to be the Grinch who stole Christmas because of supply chain problems. I can't promise that every person will get every gift they want on time. Only Santa Claus can keep that promise. Humor from the 46th president. Mark, who knew? Back to you. Thank you, Tim. Great content as always. Now after this short break, we're talking liberty with Scott Casenza to prognosticate on the ongoing abortion case in the United States Supreme Court. What's the timeline? What's the process? And what's being ignored? We'll be right back. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Abortion is back in the Supreme Court. Some think this new makeup with three conservative justices appointed by President Trump spells the death knell for Roe v. Wade. Others offer a more cautious approach and figure that there'll be some curtailment, but no bright line ruling. Well, someone who's studied the case closely and has written and recorded on the topic extensively is Uprising host and Liberty Nation's legal affairs editor, Mr. Scott DeCasenza. Welcome back, Scott. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Now, Scott, we know we're not going to get any decisions right away here, but what's the likely (laughs) timeline for a ruling? Uh, my birthday as yours is in July, uh, it's safe to say we'll have one by then. That, that's the only prediction I'm comfortable making with respect to the timing. So that's when the, this session of the court ends and all the business court, must be concluded. The court, there's no must for the Supreme Court regarding its calendar. The Supreme Court, uh, you know, you could read Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution, which sets up the court, and it's very limited in uh, what things are uh, proscribed or prescribed rather. Um, The court sets its own calendar and it concludes its work in the summertime, uh, typically by the end of June, a couple days into July uh, for the late breaking stuff. So with a case this this big, um, I suspect it will go, you know, deep into the spring, if not uh, into the late to the late date. And you have to remember, if you really want to talk about timing, the original Roe v. Wade case was re-argued. So the Supreme Court heard Roe v. Wade as a, as a case and did not decide the case when they broke for the summer and then re-heard it the next year. Uh, so that was... Due Which to, for all think, intents and purposes should have rendered the, the case moot, shouldn't it? Because the birth was already birthed. No, no because the pace of appellate processes mean that there could never be a non-moot case involving uh, an instance with like a a human gestation is nine months. So then you could never hear uh, a case under ordinary court scheduling because it would never reach there. So it's appropriate for the court to say that we're, you know, we're not going to have a ridiculous standard, therefore that we can never, never hear a case involving uh, human gestation because the, the time period for human gestation is greatly less than the gestation for a case to reach the Supreme Court. In that case, by the way, it was a seven member court that passed on ruling on it. Uh, there had been a couple of uh, retirements. And uh, so it, it heard the case with a full nine member component. And that's what the Roe decision that we know today. OK, so I'm hearing it in all the headlines that uh, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade. But that's obviously not the case being heard here. So why have the media and probably politicos in particular tied this actual case so closely to the 50 year old precedent? Well, because it sells. Uh, Roe v. Wade is the most widely known landmark case regarding abortion. And anytime abortion is challenged, those uh, who are animated against any imposition on the right to abortion talk about the overturning uh, of Roe v. Wade. That's sort of just how it goes. Um, that, that's okay. the language of our, of our politics. I, I think some people may be a little confused as to about why Roe is being challenged in this way. Now, not the moral aspect, for, but from a legal standpoint, uh, I might be wrong here, but 
Is it because Congress, the body that makes laws, has steadfastly refused to actually make a law regarding abortion? And therefore, the only real standing that Roe v. Wade has is precedence from the Supreme Court. Planned Parenthood v. Casey is the landmark decision that's actually kind of more important legally than Roe uh, for going forward. Roe just, it's not unimportant, but it just has that you know, everybody knows what what you're talking about when you say Roe v. Wade in America. Um, So, but I think Congress is limited because the Supreme Court has entered the field. So if the Supreme Court says you can't place an undue burden, for instance, on uh, abortions performed before viability, which they had said in the Planned Parenthood v. Casey decision, then there's no room for the Congress to legislate in that area. The Supreme Court has occupied the area with their ruling. The viability has changed a lot, especially since Roe v. Wade 50 years ago. Now, this is a technological aspect pushing against a legal decision, isn't it? Well, the technology can change the law, or actually the technology wouldn't change the law. The technology would change the point at which viability was recognized by the courts, right? Question in the uh, Jackson Women's Health case, which is the case that we're speaking of is whether or not pre-viability restrictions are in fact constitutional. That's the question the court will ask. So establishing that date of viability is secondary to whether or not any restrictions on pre-viability abortions are constitutional. You have to answer the first question before you get to the second question is when is viability, right? Uh, And that can change certainly with a different understanding of the biology or different technology that makes viability uh, possible at an earlier time. So does this mean that if Democrats want to make uh, unfettered access to abortion uh, a safe law for generations to come, they'd actually have to make a law? Uh, And is it political cowardice so far that's prevented them from doing so? Well, there's plenty of Republicans, first of all, that would like to enshrine that into law as well. So I think it's important to say it's not just Democrats Absolutely. that are on the, on the pro-choice side. Uh, and also, given the, the Supreme Court's entry into the, into the area, they would, people who want to see that, uh, what was the word that you used, enshrined into law for generations to come? An unfettered you need a, access. Unfettered access. So you need a constitutional amendment then to do that. Uh, And even that wouldn't be secure for generations to come. It would only be secure unless and until a new court ruled on that amendment. I mean, we have a second amendment that's supposed to guarantee the right to keep and bear arms. But uh, there are many places in this country for a long time that prevented that. And also a new amendment that could then be passed as well. So there are there's there's no guarantees, you know, that you can set in stone uh, for the for the future, unfortunately. All right, let's play hypotheticals here for a moment. And I know you don't enjoy that. (laughs) Yes. But let's say that SCOTUS rules that all or part, well, it rules in a way that would render all or part of Roe v. Wade as as done and dusted uh, and access to abortion being severely limited. What do Democrats and, as you point out, Republicans who favor the the pro-choice stance, what do they do next? Do they continue to... Uh, launch court cases through advocates? Do they try to pack the Supreme Court in the hopes that that they'll have a a stronger balance more in their favor? Or is there going to be a legislative approach to this? Well, it won't be just one thing for sure. So first of all, the Supreme Court could uh, return to a pre-Row status, which essentially was that states made their own laws regarding abortion. And some states criminalized abortion and some states did not criminalize abortion. Uh, Or they could go a step further than that and say that fetuses are people, basically, and have rights and enact a sort of federal ban on abortions. Now, I think that the first proposition is unlikely, and the second one is geometrically more unlikely. So I don't expect that to happen. But given the way that the Supreme Court has taken the case, those are uh, options that, that they could easily go down because of the question presented that they have uh that they have taken the case to resolve. Uh, But so I would say all of the above. There will be more court battles. There will be court battles in state uh, courts, uh, no matter what the outcome. You know, any kind of major change will spur legislators to pass new laws, and then those will be challenged. And 
uh, the, the dance continues. It's a full employment uh, act for those of us who comment about abortion uh, legislation. I can tell you that, Mark. Well, that ties me nicely into my final question for you, Scott. So regardless of the result, do you think that this will be the primary platform for both parties going, going ahead into the 2022 congressional elections, uh, especially from a fundraising perspective? Well, no, only because it has already been. So it's not going to be a new thing, especially for the left. Uh, I don't know uh, how well the pro-life fundraising gets with these things, but I can tell you that the moment Donald Trump got elected and started appointing judges and justices, not not just justices, by the way, but uh, they've been running on that for and very successfully for fundraising uh, ever since. Okay, we'll keep you updated on what happens with the Supreme Court case. Scott DeCosenza, thank you ever so much. Thank you, Mark. And that about wraps it up for this week's edition of Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio American Network. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to our guests, Dave Patterson and Andrew Moran. Longtime host Tim Donner is always entertaining Say What Signature segment. And to Scott Cosenza for casting light of value on the Supreme Court abortion hearing. And as ever, I want to thank you, the listener, for tuning in and taking part. I'm grateful to you all. Now my parting shot for this week. Marcus Aurelius wrote in the Emperor's Handbook, your days are numbered. Use them to throw open the windows of your soul to the sun. If you do not, the sun will soon set and you with it. Now this is a good rule to live your life by and one that would no doubt make us all more appreciative of the small and often subtle wonders around us. But it's also an admonishment to those in power. When leaders elected to steer the ship of liberty take it upon themselves to recast the mold of America or to plot a course that is determined not by the will of the people, but by political ideology, they do us all a grave disservice. But worse than the partisan hackery that has long-lasting, often irreversible impact is that these so-called leaders neglect the day-to-day business of any role in government. As Marx Aurelius says, they're at risk of letting the sun set without souls being exposed to it. Consider the issues that are of vital importance to Americans right now today. The economy, illegal immigration, shipping crises, rising deadly crime, the curtailment of freedoms. What steps is President Biden and his team taking to address these issues? To battle inflation, he passes bills that will result in printing money and greater debt. To tackle illegal immigration, he imposes vaccine mandates and travel restrictions except on those entering the country illegally. He tells us that Santa Claus is the only person who can unravel the supply chain debacle while forcing the price of gas higher and higher. It's almost as though the people who voted for him don't matter, let alone those who didn't. Joe Biden and his DC cohorts have a vision for the future and you're not involved in it. It's none of your business because his team is in charge and they'll forge ahead regardless of what you say. Our politicians see themselves as emperors, empowered to do as they please, and it's up to us, the regular people who suffer, to remind them who the real bosses are. And when we do that, their nakedness will be exposed and their castles made of sand will crumble. For if there's one thing and one thing only that you should always keep close to your heart, it's that the United States of America is the last glowing beacon of freedom in the world. Despite what media pundits in other countries may say, those folks who have the fire of freedom running through their veins know that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are documents that must be protected at all costs. For they are the bulwark against the world that seems to be embracing tyranny further and further. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Who are we? We are Americans that believe in liberty. We are a project of the nonprofit One Generation Away. We are patriots who apply the founding principles to the issues of today. And they keep moving the goalposts on us. We are educators and commentators who love America and the Constitution. Who are we? We are Liberty Nation.